orbital are spherical in nature. So you can think of the S as standing for spherical. S orbitals correspond to an L value of zero. So what we're going to learn when we start talking about the P orbitals here in a second is that this value also corresponds to the number of planar nodes. So a planar node is like a big piece of cardboard, a big plane, where you have zero probability of finding an electron. There's nothing, there's no way we can put this with the sphere and have it make any sense. So we'll see these come up with the P's and the D's, but no planar nodes. The ML value is zero. So that means we only have one orientation. When you do your electron configurations, you only have one line. Right? And so then this holds an S orbital holds a max of two electrons. Why does it only have one orientation? And what does that mean? So the orientations have to be distinct. So we have to be able to, to visually see that something different is going on, that there's uh, been a change in the area where we're going to find that electron. If you close your eyes, and I flip this upside down, and then you open up your eyes again, you're not going to know that I flipped this upside down. It's going to look exactly the same. However, when we get into different shapes of orbitals, and they're a little bit more complicated, we could flip it or rotate it, and then it becomes different from what we previously saw. Since this always looks the same, no matter how we rotate it, it only has one orientation. So when we're talking about these S orbitals, there's lots to know. So first off, as our principal quantum number, as n increases, the size of the orbital increases. And while I'm talking about S orbitals right now, this also holds true for P and D and F orbitals as well. A bigger n value means that you have a larger orbital. So therefore, 2s is going to be larger than the 1s orbital, and 3s would be larger than both of them. All right, so we've already talked about how s orbitals are spherical. And a lot of times, students will ask me, well, there's so many s orbitals inside an element. How do they look like? together. Like, what's the big picture? And there's a couple things to consider. So first off, there's this idea of nodes. So if you have a plucked guitar string, and I bring up a guitar string because remember, we're thinking of the electron as both a particle and a wave. So thinking about it this way um, addresses that wave nature of the electron. So waves, when they move, have this natural phenomenon called nodes. So the nodes would be here and here. So there's areas where you have zero displacement. And this is um, crucial with instruments. Um, but I don't want to get into the physics of all that. I just want you to know that there's these things called nodes that naturally exist of waves that are in motion. So coming over here, and you have the um, wave diagrams for the 1s and the 2s as well on your handout, but I just drew um, the 3s one. So we have this symbol here. This is the Greek letter psi. And when it's just written by itself, um, it's called a wave function. Take that wave function and turn it into a mathematical 
model to represent the probability of finding an electron, um, you need your quantum numbers. And then you're gonna, it's a pretty involved calculation, but they represent it as psi squared. And that's gonna be the electron probability density at the end of the day. So this to me is huge because it bridges two understandings of how an electron is, right? We think of electrons as having this wave nature. And so we start with a wave function and then using complex mathematics, lots of calculus, we can turn it into a probability density. Thinking back to that image of the lights in the nighttime, right? The lights and the people, whatever you took away from that, those are all particles, right? And so we're able to like connect the two, which is so cool, just by math. Um, so once they crunch the numbers and you graph them, so we're graphing that probability as a function of increasing distance from the center of the atom. So there's a decent probability of finding um, the electron in this region. And I drew, this is a cutaway view of a 3s orbital. So when you're looking at this portion, this is actually the 1s and I'll label both of them. This is the 1s orbital. And then in between the 1s and the 2s orbitals, there's zero probability of locating an electron. So again, with that white space that we saw when we were drawing the outlines um, of that p orbital. So here we have a node and here there's zero probability of finding an electron. This is uh, specifically a radial node. Um, then this pink circle, again, cutaway view, that's going to represent that 2s orbital. And then the green one, you're probably already there, that's going to be our 3s orbital. You can see the nodes clearly represented it on this presentation here. So when the line drops to zero, like right there, that's a node. So that's this node right here. And then between 2s and 3s, you have another drop off on the curve and that's going to be your second node. So when we look at this representation of the spherical orbitals, the Bohr model, even though I always like clown on it and call it the old school model, the Bohr model actually um, seems pretty reasonable, right? The Bohr model is the one with the circles that you probably first learned when you first started chemistry. So, um, but remember, this is just a cutaway view because those s orbitals are spherical in nature. So here's my model. Um, on the outside, we have this 4s spherical orbital represented by the soccer ball. So in between the soccer ball and the little green ball, they were nested in one another, but in between the soccer ball and the little green ball, there's a lot of empty space. So that's our node between our 3s and our 4s orbitals. Now, inside of the 3s, we find our 2s orbital. And again, more space in between. There's gonna be a node in between every layer of orbital. And then my 2s is this little white ball here, and then I have my 1s in the center. Again, with the 1s being the smallest of the four, right? So our p orbitals 
are described as being dumbbell shaped. And that's a legitimate term. You'll find it in a lot of textbooks and in some of the literature. And that's because they have two lobes. A lobe is an area of high probability of locating one of those electrons. What you see here is three different orientations. And so when we talk about the ML values, there's three of them for p orbitals. That means that there's three distinct orientations How do you label these? How do you identify them? Well, for P, it's not too bad. You look at the axis where the lobes are. So on this first drawing, and your drawings might be in a different order, just check them. Um, on this first one, since the lobes are on the Z axis, I'm going to call this PZ. And over here, the lobes are on the Y axis. So this is a P subscript Y. And the lobes are aligned on the x axis, so PX. P orbitals have planar nodes, and this is my planar node. And so we have this entire plane in between the two lobes where there's zero probability of finding that electron. So build my little model here. The balloons represent the lobes, and then the piece of cardboard represents the planar node. I like students to be able to identify. Um, I used to have them draw that, but eh, I realize a lot of people aren't artists. But at least be able to identify your planar node on your P orbitals. So for instance, and I'll draw it in real quick just to show y'all, but since this one is aligned on the z-axis, then we know the plane that's defined by y and x, that's going to be our planar node. So something that looks like this. And even my drawing's not that good there. So let's label it. So this one, our PZ, has a X, Y, planar node. So along this plane, your probability of finding an electron is zero. PX is going to have a y, z planar node. So this one is actually oriented backwards into the plane of the board. So your planar node would look um, something like that, where it might kind of block the backwards lobe if you're drawing it in two dimensions. This one, your planar node is just going to be um, your z and x. So something like that, um, where this one is going to be in front, right? This lobe is in front of the planar node. So Py has a x, z planar node. Last thing, just to tie everything together, um, L. L equals 1. The L value also ties into the number of planar nodes. So, so if P orbitals are dumbbells, for me the D orbitals are double dumbbells. Because they have four distinct lobes, 
even though I have four lobes, keep in mind that each one of these orientations, each one of these orbitals, only can hold two electrons. So we have five distinct orientations, so all together our D subshell holds a max of 10 electrons. One of the interesting questions that comes up here, something for you to contemplate as I'm talking, is if the planar nodes on our D orbitals look something like this, and we have our lobes in between, I ran out of balloons, I don't have enough. How do electrons go from one lobe to the other? Remember, because they have pretty much equal probability of being located in any of the four lobes. So how are they skipping those planar nodes and getting to the other side, right? I drew in my planar nodes on my dx squared y squared. I find this to be one of the easier d orbitals to recognize because the lobes are oriented or aligned with the x and y axis. dxy, dxz, and dyz their lobes are going to be in between the axes, and so they're a little bit harder to identify. So here we have one orientation. This is our second orientation, third orientation. dx squared, y squared is our fourth orientation. Um, on your lecture handout there, you have two different images of the same orientation, right? the same orbital. They just moved it in space. So you're looking at the same thing two times. One, two, three, four. And our last orientation is going to be the dz squared. It doesn't have that double dumbbell look. Instead, again, what I think in my head, it's a dumbbell plus a donut. That begs the question, where do the planar nodes fit into that? So. What you can do to get your planar nodes into a dz squared is take a piece of paper, like this is a plane, right? And if we roll it into a cone, then we could stick the cone right here, right? And it won't interfere with the donut. The donut would be on the outside of the planar cone. And then the lobe that looks like more like the other lobes, the balloon shaped lobe would be in the middle of the cone. And then we could fit our second node underneath, also shape it like a cone. So with DZ squared, um, those planar nodes take on a uh, a conical type of appearance. This is going to be our fifth orientation. Again, this is how we get five numbers and then five lines when you're doing your electron configurations and a total of 10 electrons. Let's do a quick summary of everything we've talked about. So for number of lobes, we see one lobe with our s orbital, just that one sphere. For p, there's two. d, we see four lobes. I don't go into the details or discuss f orbitals very much, but it is helpful to know that they have either six or eight lobes. They're so complicated and there's so many of them, it just gets a little bit overwhelming. For the number of nodal planes, right, think about those pieces of cardboard, we're going to have zero nodal planes for x, one for p, two for d, and then f is either going to have three or four. If you're interested in the f, Google um, F orbitals and the images will come up and you can start looking at some of that and thinking about it. For the number of orientations, 
that's going to also correspond to the number of lines that you'll draw when you do an electron configuration. So S had one orientation or one orbital, P has three, C has five, and F has seven. So we definitely see some very clear patterns emerging. The max number of electrons that each subshell can hold is related to the number of orientations. So here we're going to do 2, 6, 10, and 14. Earlier I had asked, how does an electron pass through the planar node? How does it get from one lobe to another? So, if you were thinking of the electron as a particle, you would have never came up with the answer. Because there's no way that it can get from one side to the other if it's acting like a particle. However, the answer is that the electron also acts as a wave. And waves naturally have these nodes. And so, if the entire electron density is conceptualized as a wave, you can have wave displacement over here and wave displacement over here, or electron probability over here and electron probability over here with a naturally occurring node in the middle or in multiple locations like we saw with the guitar string. So now's a good time to look at number 22 on page 18. In the first image here, we obviously have um, a spherical shaped orbital, so we know it's S. How do we figure out the n value? Remember, your principal quantum number corresponds to what's also known as your shell. So since they told us it's in the fifth shell, we know that it has an n value of 5. So I'm going to update my orbital to say that it's a 5s. Our L value, well, that's when you jot down 0, 1, 2, 3, S, P, D, F, and you just correlate those two. So since it's an S orbital, I'm going to give it an L value of 0. Here we have a really cool image, especially cool on your handout, of a D V squared. our dumbbell plus our donor. Since it's in the fourth shell, we can put a four out front when we're describing that orbital. So that means it has an n value of four, and our l value is two. This is a p, because it's just two lobes, or the dumbbells. But I can be more specific with the p. Because it's aligned along the z-axis, I know that it's a PV. They told us it's in the second shell, so I'll do a 2PV. N value is 2, and then the L value then would be 1. So I want to go back to page 17 and look at number 18 and 19. I've also added a part C in for both. So we can see how this applies a little bit to some of those uh, theoretical orbitals that aren't in use with our current elements, but if we discover or synthesize more elements, might come into play in the future. So in number 18, they asked us for the L values and the shapes. So remember the formula tells us that the max L is going to be n minus 1. So for A, my max L is 2. When n equals 4, my max L is 3. And when n equals 6, my max L is 5. That's the maximum. So underneath that, we can have lower numbers. So max L is 2, when n equals 3, 0, 1, and 2 are all allowable L values. Similarly, L can equal 0, 1, 2, or 3, 
when n equals 4. And we can go all the way from 0 to 5 when n equals 6. In terms of the shapes, 0 is x, 1 is p, 2 is b. So we get x, p, b, 3 is f, s, p, b, f. Then it just goes um, in alphabetical order. So g and h. And if you keep on going, i, j, k, so on and so forth. All right, in number 19, they ask us for the ML value. So the number of orientations. So the formula for that is 2 times L plus 1. And that's going to give us the total number of different orbitals that are possible. Um, it doesn't exactly give us the ML values. So 2 times 2 plus 1. Here we have 5. We're not done. That just means that our numbers are going to range from negative 2 all the way up to positive 2. So in terms of the ML values themselves, you want to report these values. Since there's five orientations, we know that this subshell, which is a D-shaped shape, D subshell, can hold uh, 10 electrons. When L equals 3, we're going to do 2 times 3 plus 1. And that gives us 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So our ML values range from negative 3 all the way to positive 3. Since we have 7 distinct orbitals, this subshell can hold a mass of 14 electrons. It doesn't have to, but that's the maximum. Now we get into another one of those theoretical ones. So the number of orientations, um, that formula becomes more useful here since we don't just know it. 2 times 5 plus 1. So I'm getting 11 orientations for, this would be an, an H shaped, H subshell or an H shaped orbital. So our numbers are going to be from negative 5 all the way up to positive 5. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Those are my ML values. And then the subshell, the H subshell, Since it has 11 orientations, can hold a maximum of 22 electrons.